intersection of arts, environment, culture, health, peace, justice, science, and technology, paving the road for positive social change. It's the Golden Road. One, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of examples of resilience. A, a good example would be if you think about <clears throat> the indigenous people that live in our, in our country today or anywhere in the world, really. Um, that these are cultures that oftentimes have suffered really catastrophic events, mass die-offs from disease or warfare or um, subjugation from other cultures. And they're still here, and their cultures are, are still intact, right? They still have a lineage that they've passed down for thousands of years. That's a really good definition of resilience, what a resilient community is. So, and we want to build more resilience so that we can not only survive and sustain, but we can thrive and regenerate. We can make the place that we're in better than it was before we were here. Um, so for myself, I'm a civil engineer, and I, and I mostly work with infrastructure. When, when we hear about resilience in my field of work, it almost always has to do with infrastructure, almost always. Um, and because that's what, I, that's what I do. That infrastructure can be hard infrastructure or it can be soft infrastructure. Um, you know, if, if you're worried that there's going to be a flood, you could build a flood wall. Um, but you could also develop the floodplain so that, so that you lessen these impacts of flooding. Um, one really interesting thing that, I, that I've been learning about and been encouraged of is that a lot of the engineering uh, fields that I work in are more and more um, understanding the importance of this soft infrastructure, um, like watersheds, that this is, that to develop the watershed is really important for maintaining our clean water um, um, or for managing the trees properly, right? It's, it's a really important for um, if a fire comes through. And, and, the, and there's a lot of um, links between these things. So um, that could also have a lot to do with economic development and culture. Resource management is, is not quite the same as what I do, um, but it's another um, piece of resiliency that's really incredibly important. Um, the way that we manage our resources for, our, for the community that we live in um, it really can make the community um, and much stronger. So, and it's not just resource management, it's not just infrastructure. There's so many things that contribute to the community that make our community stronger. Um, and that could be economic development, um, it can be arts and culture, it could be independent media, um, and community involvement is a, is, a big, is a big piece. And so that's why we've invited these people here today to speak, because these are people who in their communities are doing things to make their community more resilient. The, the projects and the efforts that they contribute to are building a stronger community. So we want to highlight that, make those connections stronger between people so they can share resources. And so that when we see that we know there are real solutions in the community, let's back that. You know, in a, in a world like today where, you know, with the social media that we have, which, you know, is... is have, provides a lot of benefits, it also has highlighted a lot of divisions. And I think that when we talk about what can we do together to make the community together better, and we say, oh, look, there's something that's working, that's something we can all get behind. If we see there's a real success, and we agree, this is working, and this is a solution, and it's doing a lot of good, that's something that brings a community together, because we can all agree on something. And I, and I think that's one of the key reasons why we're doing this. Um, so I, I want to um, remind everyone that we're building an asset directory. So if you want to um, contribute your name to that, we want to have a, group, a, a listing of the people who are doing this work so that if, if we need to make connections or find collaborations, we can, we can use that directory for that. Um, so let me introduce the first guest that I have here today. Um, it, I think it's worth mentioning that <clears throat> We're here at the headwaters of the Sacramento River. Um, and this, uh, I, I think this is a very um, 
resilient place. It's a protected place with public access where people can come and enjoy the beautiful landscape and see this is where your water comes from. And it's important to, to have places like this. So let me... And welcome to the Mount Seth City Park. Thank you for the opportunity to kind of give you an update of what the, our Recreation Park District do. Uh, I had the pleasure of being the, uh, the administrator for the Recreation District in South County, Mount Shasta, Weed, and Dunsmuir. Uh, it's my 43rd year. I've been very thankful to have this opportunity to provide services for our various communities. So I'll talk about Mount Shasta. We're out here, this used to be a Chico Day School back in the 20s. And it progressed to be a National Guard Armory and then got to be the City Park. And in 2006, the, the uh, Recreation Park District Board uh, was deeded the, the park from the city to be a district facility. So currently the district has two major parks. This 19 acre city park, which includes the city, uh, the headwater of Sacramento River. Uh, this is our passive park. We have a 36 acre park on the, nor on the northern part of town, on the east part of, west part of town by the high school, which is 36 acres. That is our active park. We have uh, picnic facilities, athletic fields, uh, skate parks and we have uh, built in 2000 in the year 2000 1999 the outdoor skate ice skating ice skating rink this is the largest and the only hockey regulation rink north of sacramento and i just left there this afternoon we opened up our season yesterday so we're looking to have a 14-week season uh, skate park is a very popular facility there also so our shasta east park facility has grown over the years to be one of the popular facilities for us to offer all kinds of recreational opportunities. The rec district also manages the sports fields in the city. We lease the assistant field uh, from the elementary school district for athletic field, uh, sports, the Mount Shasta Youth Sports Park, as well as the Shasta East Park. We also have agreement with the high school. We manage their baseball park to provide baseball programs for the high school as well as the various age groups here in Siskiyou County. The, Recreation Park District is pretty active in our community. As mentioned early, we provide a senior nutrition program. They pr we provide meals for seniors in South County, Mount Shasta, Weed, and Dunsmuir. We've been a ser service provider since 1986, and uh, we're all proud of that. We have developed a good program for seniors, homebound people that cannot come here to lunch. We have homebound services, which have drivers that transport in all three cities or four cities, as well as people come to lunch here. We have very special events. We partner with the service clubs in Mount Shasta, uh, work closely with the Chamber, the Rotary Club, the Elks. We have a couple of fundraisers, the Mount Shasta Rotary are hosted here, Blackberry Festival on, on Labor Day weekend. Uh, we have a bike race called the Siskiyou Craig Century, which is in uh, June. It's probably gonna be later on this year. And then we work with the Elks. They have the, their Easter egg hunt, which is here during Easter weekend. So again, we're really active in providing opportunities for various age groups. And so that's pretty much in Mount Shasta. Our staff is very uh, committed to providing all kinds of programs as well as services. My district in Dunsmuir is our smallest district. The highlight there is that they have a Botanical Gardens group, a very designed, Botanical Gardens. We work closely with the, the uh, community down there with the garden programs. We have the county's largest outdoor swimming pool in Dunsmuir. And we just uh, redone the Dunsmuir Community Center for various receptions, special events, uh, birthday parties, uh, nonprofit sponsored events. And also we manage the, the Dunsmuir Ballpark, which is, I don't know if you know, about sports, but that's the home of Babe Ruth, where he played in 1926. He came through Dunsmuir and played down there in the Dunsmuir ballpark. My district in Weed has been very active in the community. We have four outdoor parks. We have an outdoor pool. We manage all kinds of programs and facilities for the various communities. In 2014, we lost our community center due to the Bulls fire. And we're thankful that we are starting to rebuild. We started the the rebuilding process this past June, and we're hoping to have it completed by this in uh, July of 2018. And that's gonna have a therapeutic pool, a large uh, community room, uh, office space, program space, commercial kitchen, 
for us to expand our services in weed to provide many opportunities for our residents and the many visitors to our district. So as you can see, we are very active in our communities, various communities. I, I stay connected as much as I can to be involved with the promotion uh, and to provide opportunities for all our residents in our communities. So again, thank you for coming to Mount Shasta. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to working with a lot of you in the next couple of years. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank all y'all for coming out and coming up and visit us here in Mount Shasta. It's, uh, the job that I serve here in the community is um, I am the executive director of the Mount Shasta Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also the run the Mount Shasta Visitors Bureau in town here, which is a center that was housed here in the middle of town with both my office and the Visitors Bureau there, which we employ three um, part-time employees there that service the community by greeting tourists that come to the area. And you know, I'll just talk about tourism for a little bit. Mount Shasta, we're in a, uh, here in the far Northern California, and all the years prior, we were basically a lumber timber driven industry here in Northern California. And over the years, that industry has pretty much dried up after the spotted owl and all the good stuff there. And we have a lot of timberland that's still managed as timberland. So when it comes to economic development, we have to look outside the box. And you know, tourism is a big thing for us here in the Mount Shasta region. Uh, we'd like to position ourselves uh, a little different than the Tahoe region here. You know, uh, pretty much it's uh, you can spend a weekend here in Mount Shasta and get the outdoor activities you're looking for with lakes, streams, waterfalls, hiking, climbing, mountain rock climbing, whatever you desire, bike riding for nearly, not nearly the money you spend if you go to Tahoe. So that's, uh, we're showing the, the option to Tahoe is here in the far north California, which is uh, Mount Shasta. And uh, we have a new program going on now you'll be seeing in the near future called Discover Siskiyou. It's, um, it's a marketing program developed by the hotelers here in Siskiyou County that are gonna be investing half a million dollars a year into tourism and marketing the beauty that we have here in the far northern California. So that's an interesting time for us to see how that takes us up. I do know for a fact in the last three years, tourism levels have been up in the Mount Shasta region, which is a good thing. Um, I, prior to being with the Chamber of Commerce, I was the marketing director for the Mount Shasta Ski Park for many years before that. So I could see how the, how the snow flew in the winter is pretty much how our tourism flows also here in the Mount Shasta area. Summertime, we have, we have a great destination area in the summer and we always have here in Mount Shasta. We've all enjoyed it, culminating with our 4th of July run walk that we have every year annually, which is a, a huge boon to our economy. We have approximately 300 members of the Chamber of Commerce at Mount Shasta. Um, out of those 300 members, quite a few of those are from out of our area, being South County. A lot of McLeod folks, um, uh, businesses in Dunsmere. Uh, we represent, I feel we represent the whole South County with our centrally located offices and the visitor center being right there. Um, I also serve on the board of directors here in Siskiyou County of the Shasta Cascade Wonderland Association, which is based out of, out of the Reading area, which covers five Northern California counties, which is devoted to tourism. Uh, we also, I also serve on the board of the other Welcome Center at the border, which is uh, the um, C2C Joint Powers Authority here in Siskiyou County, which is the other Welcome Center on the Klamath River as you come in from Oregon. So I cover both ends of the area when it comes to tourism, both areas. Uh, we just did a, a, a recent um, workshop with JEDI here in town and also the EDD department for the North, Northern California region. And we found out that our number one source of growth for business here in our area is tourism. And we have to look at that. Uh, um, when there's more tourism, there's more restaurants, there's more shops, and, uh, and then everybody can survive. We just have to find a way to keep the tourism going all year round and eliminate the shoulder seasons. But uh, we've got a strong chamber of commerce. We've got a great group of businesses in it. Um, we have more new businesses opening downtown. We have a new AT&T store opening downtown, so that's uh, going to be nice for us. We don't have to travel to Reading or to Medford to get our services. And uh, we do quite well. We've got our events are strong here in the area. Like I said, the 4th of July event. We also do a spring golf tournament for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and right now, this coming up next weekend, we're having our, it's our annual winter magic and we're having our holiday light parade. It's gonna be our first annual this year. It's something new for us. And uh, as of uh, yesterday, when I was in the office, we, we had already hit my goal for the floats for the, for the parade. So I'm pretty excited about that. And they're more and more signing up this week. So. If you're not busy the day after Thanksgiving, come on out to downtown Mount Shasta. We got a great little festival and with our annual tree lighting also that takes place at 6 p.m. So uh, Mount, Mount Shasta is a great place to be. If you're watching this in Nevada County, I spent many years there myself in the Auburn Grass Valley area, Nevada City area. And uh, when I left there, this is where I came. So from one beautiful area to another. But uh, thank you for the time tonight. 
Any questions on the Chamber of Commerce, feel free to look us up at visitmountshasta.com. Very active tourism website we have here to tell you all things good in Mount Shasta. Or you can visit us at themountshastachamber.com also for more information. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Michael, for putting this together and having me here to, to uh, represent the, um, our group, which is McLeod Partners and McLeod Millworks. Welcome to McLeod. Um, we, uh, in July 1st of 2014, we purchased the mill from Nestle's, the former McLeod Mill site. Um, the, the mill, I always tell people, there's nothing between the, ma the ma mountain and the mill. And it's just an incredible opportunity that we have to redevelop this property. Next. The McLeod Mill started in the 1880s, and it, it is an incredible piece of property, and it was the largest cedar mill in California. At one point, they were producing a million board feet of lumber a day, and it's um, it, an amazing property. That's back when logging was big. It, it was a company town. If you worked in the mill, you were allowed to live in the town. You shopped at the company store. You, shopped, you ate at the company restaurants. You went to the 28,000 square foot hospital to have all your, from, from cradle to grave, they took care of you. Once you were out of work at the mill, you had to move from the property and you, in two weeks you had to leave town. The mill at one point employed 1,500 men. This was a big mill. Thanks. It's a big, big mill and a big dirty site. It's the largest heavy industrial zone site from San Francisco to the Oregon border. It's 278 acres. It's all zoned heavy industrial. It had seven processing mills on the site. This is a 14 acre log pond that they fill 24 seven with a, a valve that could dump a million gallons an hour into that pond. This is, a big, this is a big mill, that's a big pond. They have a lot of water rights. Why Nestle's was there. Again, another big dirty picture. People forget how dirty lumber processing was. This smokestack here burned all the wood waste and it heated all the buildings in town from the mill. They also heated all the sidewalks and melted all the snow off the sidewalks. Um, it was pretty industrious. Thanks. Then the mill closes. So between logging issues, environmental regulations, the um, it was decided it went through a couple ownerships. They tried to save it and then it closes. So what we purchased in t July 1st of 2014, thanks Jim, next slide, was a big old industrial site that had been abandoned for an, a decade and a half. There wasn't an intact window, there wasn't an, um, a volt of electricity, there wasn't an ounce of water on the site, and it had heavily overgrown. Thanks Jim. It was a, but we bought a city. We bought uh, 400,000 square feet of buildings, 278 acres, all overgrown, all in disrepair, and we decided to take this process on. So we started working on the buildings. This is the, the old fuel building, which is a, a cement bunker. We just shot a, a movie, an apocalyptic film in there, which turned out great. This is the largest wood building in California. It's 106,000 square feet. It's 970 feet long. We have it all powered now with LED lighting, state-of-the-art um, cameras, and there's 240 vehicles in storage there right now. Um, we, uh, we, tr we've, we started with the mission statement of being environmentally responsible, good stewards of the land, and to bring companies and the jobs they provide to town. So that's what we started with. This is our first day on the site. We put, plunked a sign, put my cell phone number. That's the front gate. The mountains in the background and the, the, the crane shed is right there. That's my partner, Dave. It was the two of us that decided to take this property on. That's not Photoshop. This is a spectacular photo that I just took with my camera one of the first days. And it showed the brilliance of the property and the, the spectacularness of Mount Shasta. And that was our inspiration that became our, our driving point to go forward with the property. Now this is the journey of, of any great idea. You end up with, wow, this is a terrific idea. And then you, you fall into the pits of what have we done? 
and we did. It's 278 acres of just complete blight and neglect. And I feel like we're on the way out. Um, it wasn't until January 1st of this year we had our first tenants. Now I've got eight uh, working tenants on the site. Um, we have 20 employees and we're keeping, we're keeping to our word of hiring locals and starting good businesses there. This is one of our cleanup efforts. Nestle's blew up all seven mills on the property so the town could never think they could put a mill in there. I wasn't involved in the fight pro or con Nestle's. I just tell people I'm post Nestle's. We took over after they left, we bought them out. Now we clean the property up, but they left piles of debris like this. Massive cleanup effort. This is the first time we put water on the property. There was no water on the property for the, uh, the previous 15 years. Nestle's didn't, they welded all the valves on the, on the hydrant shut. So you couldn't put a fire out there if you did have a fire. So by doing, by reinstituting the water, we also get big elements there. This is a good, this is a good picture. We get about 10 feet, 20 feet of snow there, depending on the year. And it's a lot to deal with. And that's also a, a big element of how quickly we can move, move forward. We basically have an eight month building season and a four month snow season. This again is one of our cleanup efforts. We've cleared 65 acres of scotch broom. We've created defensible fire space on the property. And these, all these buildings now have power. All these buildings are now habitable. We've got eight working bathrooms on the site from zero. And then we've put power to about 140,000 square feet. Next slide, Jim, thanks. Being it's such a big property and big buildings, this building is 85 feet tall. We have, everything is enormous. Our, our electrical runs are half a mile, quarter of a mile, and it's a lot. And we had to redo everything because in its time of abandonment, the guys who like to do that kind of thing came and stole all the copper, took all the wiring out of the place, broke every window, broke every light bulb. And so we had, a, we started from scratch. This was the first day we turned power on in the site. That's me in the background. And again, those are all LED lights, which Pacific Power has, that's part of the resilience, part of the sustainability. It's stick, sticking to our mission of hiring locals and doing things right and being a good steward of the land. We've replaced about 12, 14 acres of roof. I mean, we could re replace roofs forever. Um, these also are, you're trying to do things in sustainable ways, reusing. We have a, a big bone yard. We reuse materials, we're reprocessing. Um, our attitude is to stick with our, our core principles, which is to, to be responsible stewards of the land and be conscious about how we're, our, our carbon footprint. Again, one of our spaces, I have a gaming manufacturer who goes in this space, hiring locals. I have a prefab Quonset hut builder, Q Cabin, from Vern Sneed from Mount Shasta. He's a general contractor, and he built five homes out of that space this year. And this was another one of my tenants shipping a project that he built. We do, we're, we're looking, we had 1,100 people on the site for the eclipse, which was just tremendous. And the Wintoon chief uh, blessed the site and, and ran a 90-minute meditation during the uh, eclipse event. And it was just a spectacular event and we intend on doing more. Again, and we're taking care of the locals. This is one of my local tenants. She's got a, um, a fix it shop and she buys things, repairs them and sells them on, on a garage sale type of thing. And she's making a go of it. And, she, and it's great to be able to provide her space and she's thrilled to be out there. This was an impromptu event where we had a thousand people show up for a party, probably the best party. Don't you agree, Jim, that had been in McLeod forever. Um, we had six bands, um, a thousand people. At one point we had 250 people out there line dancing, 249 who could, and then myself. And it was, it was so much fun. I couldn't believe how great the sound was in that building. 
Turns out you have to seismically retrofit that building to do this on a legal basis, but we will do more events like this. It was, it, and it was a very impromptu event because it started pouring that morning, and this was an event that was supposed to go on outside um, on the town square, and we got a nine o'clock phone call for an event that started at 10 o'clock and it came off like clockwork. It was really fun. This is another, I have a uh, Forever Green Christmas Tree Company. It's another one of my great tenants and it's a tremendous success story. Again, we're an incubator to help people get along and we gave him some land to start with and now he's up to 4,500 trees, living trees that have grown in pots and people foster these trees. They go back and forth to people's homes in the Bay Area and then come back up after New Year's and they spend the year on the site. Then we have two weekends a year where these that these are customers from Google, Netflix, Yahoo, who come up and camp on the site to visit their Christmas tree. And he does events. They go out to the falls. They have music on the site. Um, but it's, it's become very successful. We will have a camp out for 500 Google employees on the site this summer. We have... Um, Glamping cabins, these are glamour tent cabins that we have. We're filling a four acre lake on the site right now to stock with trout and these will be on the, the, the shoreline. We're gonna have a big beach, um, which will go along with all our events and some of our other activities on site. This is a layout of the site. We, again, we started with this big industrial site and then we decided to, to okay, we're gonna cordon this off and how we're gonna lay this property out. So we have an industrial area where we have ma light manufacturing and local, um, local, local citizens who, who have businesses there. And then we have this view corridor. That view of the mountain will always remain open. That should never be built. And so we're, gonna, we're building a uh, 10 to 12 acre concert site. We have a parking and camping area. We have parking for 5,000 cars. And then we're gonna have uh, heavier manufacturing over on this side. I just had a tenant take this building, and we're just moving forward with development. And again, we started with a property that had been abandoned for 15 years, had no water, no power, and we now have eight businesses out there and uh, lots of activity going on. It was pretty busy out there today. We provide, and one of the other things we provide in the town, we, we do free firewood for all the seniors in the, in the community. Um, we did a couple of timber harvest, which provided us with about five, 600 cords of wood. And so we split and dried and we provide free firewood to all the seniors in town. And I think we're on to the last slide. Oh, this is a nice, um, I have wonderful people who are helping me lay these buildings out, do 3D models of it. We're able to do um, real time um, photos of how the property works and how your, your business will fit in that space. And this is my last slide and that's, Oh, there's, there's another. That's, so it's pretty spectacular. When you come to this property and Mount Shasta is in the background, there's no prettier view of Mount Shasta than from this site. That's what you get every day. I never get tired of it. I'm very fortunate to have this opportunity. My earlier slide said McLeod Millworks and McLeod Partners. My ownership group is McLeod Partners. The property is called McLeod Millworks. We have McLeodPartners.com, which explains my, the ownership group and how we work in our, our mission statement. And McLeod Millworks is actually my links to all my tenants on site and the businesses that are coming. We will have a brewery, we will have other things going on and it's just exciting to move forward in this county. I love this place and we didn't buy it for anything other than wanting to do good by this uh, community. And Nestle had uh, long ago stopped taking care of the property. They needed to go away. Thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. That was that was excellent. Um, that's <clears throat> that's a really exciting project that you mentioned to us, and I, I want to thank you for uh, what you did. That really brings to mind one of the things I mentioned before, which is we're not really looking just to be sustainable in our communities. We want to be regenerative, and we want to you know take places that maybe have suffered and build them up into places that are actually growing and thriving. Um, 
and you touch on the, the, the activities on your project are touching on so many different aspects of life in the community. And it seems kind of broad when you talk about this all as the same thing because it's arts and culture and economics and media. But really, a lot of these things are connected, just the way that the timber harvest is connected with the um, resource management of the land, which is connected with all, all um, of these different things, the economic resources of the community, small businesses. So I won't go on. But um, I just wanted to, th to thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And um, I think uh, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, with resilience and restoration, uh, not so much on the economic side, but I'm, I'm involved in the environmental side or the natural history or the ecosystem. I'll tell you a little bit about maybe uh, the type of work I do and maybe types of research or uh, restoration projects that there are going on around here. And I, Michael uh, asked me to talk about uh, some of the water issues uh, that I've been involved in too, and I can maybe run, run over some of those. And, um, I guess I should say that uh, I didn't have to live here, and uh, I chose to move here. Uh, I got my degree and uh, my my work in a research area. I'm a I'm a research ecologist, and I started doing research in the universities, doing basic science, and um, I, that that was interesting. I enjoyed it all, but uh, I thought there could be more, and I I was interested in uh, maybe bridging what science can offer towards real resource management problems. And I became, I guess, what you'd call a consultant. I'm, I call myself a consulting ecologist. And um, I was in uh, uh, Corvallis, Oregon. I was doing research projects up there, and there's a lot of forestry and uh, stream type projects. I uh, decided I would try to do some consulting, get a break away from the research field. I became like a research refugee, and I decided to, to go into con the consulting field. And a lot of people asked me, why are you doing that? Uh, it was a big move, but I decided that uh, I would rather bridge science towards real problems and have people that were really interested in solving problems talk to me instead of just doing research that you put in, in the library and, and books. And from there, I uh, uh, we moved then to um, Mount, Mount Shasta here just as a discretionary move because uh, once I started my business, uh, getting a few projects here and there, we found that uh, I could do it from home and I could live wherever we wanted to. And we started looking from Corvallis, where would we want to live? And my wife was from California. We wanted to move a little closer to California. And as long as I could still do work in uh, Oregon, we thought, well, Mount Shasta seemed like the good place to move. And it was a risky move because there's not a lot of uh, research type projects going on here. But I'm really glad I did it. Um, um, it turns out with the, with the rise of the internet and uh, networking, you can pretty much work in a lot of different areas and live where you want. And that's what I do. So I raised my family here. They've uh, My kids have grown up and, and uh, gone on to other things and I'm still living here now. And I'm going to talk about the types of projects I've worked on uh, here and, and uh, and it's been largely in the area, I, I, I'm not so much of an environmental consultant. There, when, you, when you talk about those people, they're usually, I would say, working more in permitting, um, compliance, and when people want to build a project, how do you follow the laws? And, and, and I've been involved in that a little bit, but I'd like to think of the work I do as more of using science to um, uh, manage, the, manage nature. And projects I've worked on, let's see, uh, I think there's about four or five different projects that, uh, that, uh, that I've worked on. I, uh, one is with the Trinity River Restoration Program. The Trinity River is a river just west of here. Many of you probably know it. And uh, they built a dam there. And uh, the, the salmon started declining with the building of the dam. And eventually, uh, they came around and said, listen, we need to restore this river somehow. And there's a big program now, a federal program that is funded at the level of about $15 million a year to restore the Trinity River and try to get the, the fisheries back to pre-dam levels. And I'm involved with that in, 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 a, in a small way, I would say. I, I help out with, uh, with meetings they have, and they have to have, make decisions on that. So the Trinity River is a big program that's going on here now. It's a really lovely river, too. It's, I'd say it's still functioning very well. 
but it has a huge restoration program going on and probably one of the biggest in the in the nation i would say for river restoration you'll see big uh construction sites going on in there and that those are being set up to actually build the river back the way it should be so the trinity river is one of them another one i've worked on here in mount shasta is, is the shasta river uh, i've worked with the uh Shasta R RCD uh, Resource Conservation District. It's kind of a semi-autonomous uh, organization that gets money to do restoration, um, and they work a lot with the ranching community. So it's a pretty interesting group. Uh, uh, the, I don't know how I should say this. The ranching community is, uh, you know, they're focused on their their product. It's, it's an industry, and of course like most industries uh, there can be environmental consequences from that um, the big one is irrigation they, they irrigate water and and yet the shasta river uh, flows off the slopes of mount shasta it comes from spring fed uh, uh, systems and it's one of the most amazing rivers uh, being really pure water uh, having uh, anadromous fisheries come up from the, the pacific ocean uh, coho uh, Chinook, Steelhead come into there. And yet, there's, as uh, California is really good at developing their resources, uh, it's, it's been a real uh, resource development history, starting with the gold rush that brought people here to California. And a lot of those people saw what well, the resources here, we could use these rivers to uh, create a, a nice uh, agricultural business. They need that water to irrigate the land because we live in a Mediterranean climate here, which is very dry in the summer. They need the water to grow things in the summer, so they take the water out of the river. And there's consequences for the anadromous fisheries. So the Resource Conservation District gets money from the state of California, and they try to work with the ranchers to improve the, uh, the fishery conditions and work with them on uh, irrigation projects. And it's a pretty interesting group. And I've worked with them on a, uh, a number of projects. And uh, one we worked on was they, they instituted riparian fencing because they like to graze the cattle there and they get into the river, so they started putting fences there. And we looked at the, uh, the consequences of the riparian fencing and how well it's working in, in a restoration format. Um, let's see, other programs we worked in. Uh, I, I work uh, on another type of project. Uh, in fact, I hire a lot of young guys here in Mount Shasta have worked with me on this, and I'm seeing, seeing there's a lot of interest, young people, are looking for opportunities to do work that's in a restoration uh, format. And a big project we do every spring, we work with Warehouser Corporation in, uh, back in Oregon. It's, it's a job I had started when, when we lived in Corvallis. We look at fish distributions on lands owned by Warehouser. Before they do a clear cut in Oregon or a harvest, they need to know whether or not there's fish in their streams. And if there's fish, they have to do a bigger uh, buffer, they call that, or a stream protection along the stream. If there's no fish, they're allowed to have less protections for the stream. So they, uh, they hire us to go out there with these backpack electroshockers. We walk around in the forest on their lands, and we shock the streams, and we produce a, a survey of the streams on their lands. And it's a lot of fun for young guys get to, get to climb around in the forest, see a lot of landscape, and plus they get to shock fish in the streams and net them and handle fish. So that's a lot of fun too. And I, I've hired a lot of young, uh, young guys here from uh, Mount Shasta. They've shown interest in that. So we're always looking for new workers, and then we're going to be doing it again this spring. And anyone's interested, and they can call, contact me through Ecosystems Northwest. We're on the, we're on the web. <coughs> Let's see, other projects I've worked on uh, restoration-wise. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, another project that's not so stream-related, it's, it's, it's my favorite project. It's maybe the last one I'll talk about. And uh, my training is, is uh, not so much as a fisheries person, although there's been a lot of work in there because anadromous fisheries are so important here in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. I've got work in that area and I became a de facto fisheries biologist. But my original training is in uh, watershed function, forest watershed function, and, and specifically carbon cycling. How forests absorb and release carbon is what I looked at because I was real interested in this, this, this process of CO2 increases and global warming back in graduate school. And I thought, well, if I, uh, I could actually consult in that and not just do research, 
Um, I like to have consulting because my dad was a, a, owned his own business himself and he, he seemed to have a pretty good life. And I thought, well, if I can be a scientist and own my own business, a consultant was the way to go. And I thought, well, carbon cycling, this is certain to be a problem. And this is back in the 80s when I was studying it, that um, I'll get into that and, and I'll have work all over the place in this. And it turned out though, I, I had no idea about the politics. The US, US wouldn't sign the Kyoto Protocol. So we never really got on the ball on carbon uh, cycling or, uh, or uh, 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 processing carbon. How do you manage the landscape for carbon? But however, now, as you know, California has made that decision to become uh, work on their uh, carbon footprints and have a cap and trade program. So there's two projects I'm working on now that just got going uh, in forests and carbon cycling. And, and what I like, what I'm doing is how do forests absorb carbon? How, how good of a sink? And can we do things in the forest that might enhance that sink that they could be a larger storage of carbon and hopefully reduce the, uh, mitigate the impacts we're seeing with uh, global warming and CO2 increases in the atmosphere. One project is up in the Chester area with the Forest Service. We're, we're looking at a series of forests and we're describing how carbon cycles through the soil. Uh, it's not really well studied. A lot of people know about how carbon is fixed in forests, but it turns out soils are a much larger store of carbon than the forest. They're up to three times more carbon is stored in the soil than in the forest. We don't really understand them very well. So we have a project where we're trying to look at, uh, as they're gonna institute some forestry practices there, how might that affect the cycling of carbon through the soils? And uh, one last project I'm working on, not so much, well, I, I guess it, it would be called Restoration 2, uh, just a brand new one that's just getting started with the California cap and trade, um, uh, where California caps the CO2 that can be emitted by industries. And that means you can only emit so much CO2. And if they can't meet their cap, they're allowed to purchase a little bit of an offset from forests. And, um, the offsets from the forests, people who own the forest are able to say, well, I'm gonna manage my forest in a way that absorbs a little more carbon and I can sell those credits to these people who need these caps, that's called cap and trade. Um, however, in order to sell the credits in the forest, they have to prove that they're really doing something different and unique above business as usual to absorb that carbon. And that's where I kind of come in. There's, there's businesses now where we're getting some work where they're selling their, they're, 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 they're putting their carbon credits on a market so the, so the emitters can purchase it and it has to be verified. So now we're going around uh, to different forests who are asking to have their credits be verified. So we go out to the forest, we're kind of like tax auditors almost. We go to the forest and we are gonna verify indeed that they're doing something right in their, in their operation that uh, they are fixing more carbon there. So that's a new new industry that's coming along now, and uh, we're getting work in that too. So that's like that's the last type of restoration type work. So it's both been in water related. Now it's starting to transition more to carbon carbon type pro programs. So so again, I'll just wrap my comments up that uh, I'm a uh, I'm a I'm a, I'm a scientist that turned into, a, into a, operating a consulting business. I was able to move to Mount Shasta and live a wonderful life here in a wonderful area. And it's worked out really well for me. And I think other people, there's a lot of young people now are, are asking themselves, well, what do I wanna do with my career? I think there is a growing career in the restoration field and um, in areas like streams or as is a mature field and the carbon field is, is, a, is a growing field now. And there's other things you can do too. And I'd like to say that, uh, I like the comments about how uh, uh, tourism is really important here in Mount Shasta. I, I, can, I can see that, that we're, the product Mount Shasta will really produce is a, is, a, is a tourism resource that people want to come here and see a natural environment and, 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 and play in it and interact with it. And I think restoration is really important in that we maintain this type of uh, pristine or this, this, this thing that everyone thinks they like when they see nature and they, they love it here. And, and so restoration fields should be growing. And I hope that our society continues to support it. And California is pretty progressive in that they do it, but who knows what, with, uh, you know, uh, there's it, always this, this uh, give and take or push and pull that 
industry needs to make money, you know, and sometimes they don't really, well, I have to be careful how I say it, but I think you know what I'm saying, that uh, industry is usually profit motivated and the uh, restoration or preservation of the environment usually is secondary on their, on their, uh, their agenda. Some industries are better than others, and, but I think if the citizens demand it, you know, industries will follow it because usually they're producing a product that the citizens purchase. So the citizens have a lot of uh, a sway on that. And, and I'm seeing that California is very progressive in that. And I like, I like what I see in California. So, and I like what I see in Mount Shasta. So thank you. We never know what to expect when people come to a live broadcast of the show. Some want to come for the performances. Some want to come for the potluck and the food. Some want to come for the education. Some want to come to do networking. And others come uh, who want to present um, music, their voice uh, to the community. So we've created this show really as a forum that every week we're out in the communities, not only doing live broadcasts, but really doing um, focuses on individuals and organizations that are contributing to the quality of life here. Again, from Sacramento all the way up to the state line of Oregon and from Truckee, Tahoe, all the way to Sacramento. Um, my personal area of um, expertise and interest, I've worked uh, for several universities, starting with the five, college, uh, five colleges in Amherst, Massachusetts and Northampton, where I worked for Smith, uh, Mount Holyoke, uh, Hampshire College, Amherst College, and UMass, where I worked for the theater arts department. So um, since I've been in California, I worked for the University of California, Santa Cruz, from their theater arts department. But I moved to Nevada County about uh, seven years ago because the trend is that arts and culture, in mostly in our society, are seen as, uh, well, something that's on the side. It's an accessory to uh, lifestyle and quality of life. So a lot of the... Uh, the resources and funding for the arts dwindled while biotech was going through the roof. So I could see the trend and I really wanted to find um, an innovative way where I could do what I love to do, but also uh, serve the community and not just my own self-interest of doing arts and productions. And I have produced uh, some fairly sizable events. Um, so again, not to toot my own horn, but just to say that I've really gone from this global perspective to really bringing it to my own backyard and to the region that I live in. And one of the ways I can do that is by showcasing uh, some of the people that you've seen here today. Um, although we have this theme of, of sustainability, resilience, and economic development, arts and culture, but over the last 14 months covering 180 individuals and organizations. So a little bit later when we have our potluck, we're gonna get our blood sugar going. Um, and we're gonna do a little bit of a team building exercise through community drumming. This is something I've done internationally. Uh, I work in a lot of schools because in this day and age, so many kids um, they call it Generation Glow, are looking at their phones, that they're not making that face-to-face uh, -face eye contact. They're, not, they're, they're alienated. They feel uh, trapped in some alienation and solitude because even though the technology is a benefit and we're using it today, it's also a way that keeps people, um, and even on the level of the brain, from having that human enriching experience. So what I do is I come into classrooms. I've worked with everything from senior centers and universities to preschools. Uh, I work with a lot of downtown business associations where I come in with the drums and we get people doing nonverbal communication, leadership development, uh, creative self-expression and self-esteem development through a very ancient discipline called drumming. So that's what I do uh, when I'm not here uh, working on the show. And there's a lot more I'd like to say, but I wanna just use that as a way to parlay an introduction for the next person. Um, one of my very good friends, uh, Steve Goldsmith, who does uh, multimedia, he's been doing multimedia uh, work for a long time. He's worked with a lot of musicians and groups in a lot of different venues. Um, recently, I collaborated with him and his daughter, Michelle Goldsmith, who uh, recently, uh, I believe over the last year and a half, has taken over uh, what was, in, at one point, a very legendary venue for productions and recording. 
Um, a lot of artists uh, did recording there, groups like Tom Petty, Tool, legendary producer, whose name I can't recall, but I'm gonna let her talk about that. But nonetheless, she's uh, moved into the area and opened a venue at the Palace Theater in Weed, where she's very committed to giving the community another opportunity to present on stage. Uh, a few months ago, I brought my group up, the World Beatniks. We're a world music group with a message. We talk about, you know, many cultures, but regardless of politics or religious beliefs, um, age or gender, that the arts are a way that we can all get together and enjoy that human experience without having to let all the things that divide us get in the way. So we went and we did a performance there with the World Beatniks. And uh, I have to say, it's, it's a great establishment. I know she's building. She's also pr trying to provide conscious and healthy food. But I'll let her talk about what she's doing. But I just wanted to get up here to um, share a little bit more of my vision about what we're doing with the show, how we're giving people features. I come out every week, three, four days a week. I'm shooting educational pieces. I'm going to events. We work with lots of venues and organizations. We're actually building an upcoming event calendar so people who are a little bit more with their finger on the pulse of independent media and want to know what's happening can find out what's happening and can help to support the organizations and the people that really are community minded. So on that, I would have got a nice round of applause and I'd like to welcome uh, someone who's been really working very hard and I have a great deal of respect and appreciation for her uh, from the Weed Palace Theater, Michelle Goldsmith. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, Michelle Goldsmith as uh, Michael here uh, introduced. Uh, the director and producer at the Weed Palace Theater. Beautiful um, legend in the community of Weed. Uh, historical landmark um, in, in, in the heart of Weed on Main Street uh, that we've been restoring into a live concert venue now for um, almost two years. We've been um, open again to the community and uh, restoring the structure into the glorious establishment that it uh, has um, a... Uh, very rich history of being. Um, so I'm very honored to be carrying forward the legacy of Sylvia Massey, who is the uh, renowned recording artist that has brought many, many talented musicians to the area and put her um, work uh, and life force into building a beautiful business in the historic Weed Palace Theater that I am now uh, carrying forward and bringing into a uh, community-oriented endeavor around arts, um, culture, music, entertainment, and um, so forth. And so, you know, we uh, are continuing to grow with our up and coming events. Um, our next event will be December 1st, a group called Terrapin Flyer. They are out of um, upstate New York. So we have a um, good bit of interest from um, groups that are um, able to make the stop off since our location is right off of the interstate of I-5 and um, get to experience this beautiful community uh, with the majestic Mount Shasta located right above the theater as well, just um, directly uh, in line, helping to um, really enhance the energies that uh, we're all working on um, with the uh, building and growing community here. So I am very thankful for the time today um, to get to speak on a public template and bring more um, familiarity and uh, reach out to our community as far as what we're doing here. So um, again, the Weed Palace Theater on Main Street. We are on Facebook where you can see our up and coming events. We also have an Eventbrite link and have a nice schedule of very talented musicians coming up and look forward to be able to deliver um, more uh, of an outlet and um, help to uh, 
Agro Community uh, Foundation here in Siskiyou County and beyond. So thank you again. Arts and, and culture are really critical to what we're talking about here because really the way that ideas and behaviors are formed is through who we believe we are. And that's reflected in the songs we sing and the games we play and the sports we play. The, those, the, the things we spend our time doing and believing and believing ourselves to be, that's really what forms the ideas about how you're going to run a business, how you're going to manage your life and the landscape and your community. So it's very important. And it brings people together, brings in economic prosperity, and it gives people a voice. And so that leads me to the next guest here who um, has been um, a publisher for Lotus Guide magazine. Uh, Rahasi and Poe, and um, independent media is so critical to be able to hear different voices that aren't just um, brought down from outside, you know, voices from within the community about different ways of thinking about things. So let me I'm Rahasi Poe. You can hashtag Rahasi Uncensored and pull up a lot of what I do. My wife and I, we do the uh, Lotus Guide magazine. I have a radio show called Spiritual Activist on BBS Radio. And I like to reach out and find some of the underlying reasons that why are we so separated? And when you get to the point of being resilient, why aren't we resilient? And I think it's because so many of us feel separated as individuals and we don't see the unity at a deeper level. A while back, I wrote a book called To Believe or Not to Believe, and the subtitle was the social and neurological consequences of belief systems. While I was writing that book, I was privy to really research religion and politics and basically our world history. And I noticed that on the surface level, yeah, we, we seem so different and isolated. But I noticed with religions in particularly, if you go back in time and see where those writings originally came from, they start going into more of a unified field. And if you go down even deeper, it gets into another realm, which science is now catching up to. And this brings me to the topic that I'd like to talk about. And it has to do with something that scientists have been looking at. And if you ask most scientists, come up with an explanation right now, what's your best guess is our reality? Well, the popular consensus is our reality is a holographic reality. In other words, a simulation. Now, whether the person doing the projecting is a god or the matrix designer or the great spirit, you could call it a lot of things, but it seems like there is a process going on that is really, really similar to a holographic projection. And one of the things that brings this up and makes it really clear is, first of all, if we were in a matrix, if we're living in a holographic projection, how would we know that? Every single thing that we would use to gauge that and to try to research it is also from the hologram, the simulation. And it is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. It's an illusion. So everything that we would try to gauge it with would also be part of the illusion. So of course it's gonna look real. If we're having a dream, in the dream, if we start looking at the dream from the dream state, it looks totally real. So how would we tell if we're actually in a simulation? One of the ways is to see if there's anything underneath the fabric of space that science could tell us. And lo and behold, there is. If you look at um, the, the absolute bottom, the atomic and subatomic structure of life. Uh, Professor James Gates found an interesting thing because if you look at the process of what happens on a subatomic level, you can get that process and turn it into an equation. And the equation is very, very long, but I, I won't even say the whole, whole thing, but the equation is a error correcting block code. Now the error correcting block code is how nature keeps itself intact from the seed to all the whole process. There is an equation that explains that and it's a, a very, very uh, definite equation. So one of the people on his staff said, hey, that equation looks 
a little familiar. And lo and behold, that equation is the same exact equation that we use on the internet when we send an email. That equation grabs all of our data, all of our information, holds it intact, and puts it through the, because we're going through satellites and fiber optics and wires. If this equation didn't work right, we wouldn't get the same data at the receiving end as we do at the transmitting end. Now, why would we come up with the same exact equation that life uses if there isn't a similarity of the same process? This is leading everybody to believe that this is a simulation. And if I had time, I could go into it. There's probably 10 different things that really show us clearly that we're living in a holographic universe. Now, why is this important? Because in a hologram, a hologram comes from one image. And as that image goes out, you can take any part of that image and create the whole. Well, we do the same thing. We are a direct reflection of the universe in the same way that every DNA in our system could build another me, another you. It is the same holographic process. And this becomes important because if we can recognize this, this undercuts all of the feelings of individuality and separation that we feel in the world. We are part of one unified field. Religions call it God. Every thing has a name for it, but it is a unified field of consciousness. And if we can understand this on a nuts and bolts level where we can actually see an equation it will help us understand and go deeper into the aspect of why we feel so separate. Why do we feel like all of you sitting out here? It is really, really an illusion that we are separate. We are part of one thing, one being, one consciousness, one energy. That becomes really important to recognize because if that's true, we are part of one data stream, one data stream of information, and that data stream goes both ways. So if I'm doing my, whatever it is, prayers or meditation to get in touch with that deeper aspect of myself and really doing the inner work, I'm connecting with that data stream. At that point, my thoughts become very, very important because in a holographic projection, if you take one part of the hologram pull it out, it'll take, it'll reproduce the whole hologram. But if you change that one little aspect, it will change all of the other aspects of that hologram and bleed back up into the main holographic projection. This is why and how we can change this world by doing the work on ourselves and being conscientious, doing the inner work and the outer work. Events like this are really important you know, this gentleman here is, is taking a piece of land and bringing it back. Other people are looking out for us with the forest and our environment and our water and everything. And we're all doing everything that we can possibly do. And it's really important to see how this process can really wake us all up to our inner divinity, however you want to put it. And it has nothing to do with religion as we see it in the everyday world. It's become so conflictive out there. Most of the wars are religious holy wars. Politics does nothing but divide us. We need a new way to think about life. We need a new way to see ourselves, our place in this world and in, in reality itself. And I think if we can do that, we'll have a really good shot at um, saving ourselves because right now, we cannot continue to do the game the way we've been doing it. If we continue down this road, we're done for. It's not going to work. We have to back up, reevaluate, uh, get away from the corporate news and start going into the independent media sources like this, my magazine. There's a bunch of radio shows out there, YouTubes. If you get in there and do your, your work, and it takes work, it takes a lot of work to get out there and find out what's going on. And it takes a certain amount of courage too. And that takes heart, which is actually courage is the French word for courage. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of determination and a lot of will. And that's what we're missing in this world. You know, a lot of us, we know what to do. 
We know the right thing to do. We just don't have the will to do it. Apathy will be the thing that will bury us if we're not careful. So becoming a, an activist, doing events like this, talking to people, getting people to think. Like I'm not necessarily wanting to tell somebody what to think. That's, that's going to be up to them after they get the information. I just want people to think. Start thinking instead of just sitting around letting information come into you from a corporate media source and that all have a, an agenda. And we read our history books, but history is written by the victors. We have to remember this and start reaching out for new information and new ways to live and new ways to be ahead. But what they found in biology is something really, really unique and really important because if you want to know what's going on in the world and what's, what is happening, what are we doing? It looks so chaotic, but there's something that happens in nature that can maybe clarify this a little bit. We all know about the caterpillar becoming a butterfly and we've just accepted that as a transformational analogy, a metaphor for our inner transformation. But what sciences have been doing lately is looking at right when the caterpillar, for unbeknownst reason to himself, starts hanging upside down and making a, a chrysalis. Now inside that chrysalis is, if you open it up at a certain point, it's just goop. It's so chaotic that you would think there's no life form there at all because it's complete chaos. But what they know now is they have imaginal cells strategically placed throughout that chaos. And those imaginal cells hold the pattern of the butterfly. And around those imaginal cells, they know now that all of the other cells start forming to it to form the butterfly. And I think the reason this is so important is because we are imaginal cells. What you're doing is an imaginal cell doing this because you're creating not what was, not what is, but what you know can be. And if we all do this, we can create a better world by going inside because we know that we can do something much, much better. We are imaginal cells that could be creating a much better world around us. And as we look at the chaos around us, remembering that that's the old caterpillar regime breaking down and it should everything should break down at this point and reform itself into something completely new so when somebody tells me well maybe we could fix this I said, no we don't want to fix something that got us in this position in the first place we have to really really think about dismantling this whole thing we call our civilization and how we do things it, like if it's too big to fail you know if it's too big to fail it shouldn't even be you know it we we need smaller units smaller communities coming together and being more reliant on each other so that's the imaginal cells so um i think that would probably do for what i have to say today and uh if you want to know any more about us uh, lotusguide.com and Michael always has a uh, section in here where he writes about the Golden Road television and um, I always have a section Rahasi Uncensored the last one was why should we be questioning our answers it's easy almost all the answers we've ever been given I'm old enough now to see that they're wrong Every, everything I've been told by well-meaning parents professors teachers priests and preachers and historians ends up not being the truth. And as we dig deeper, it gets dismantling and a little scary sometimes, but this is the adventure of being a spiritual warrior, a spiritual activist and going out there and participating in life. So thank you very much. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Rahasia. That was that was excellent. Um, it's so important that we have alternative voices to listen to because we do. We need to question. We need to question everything. It's important for us to to ask those questions to keep our minds active. Um, and you, you know, uh, 
there's a lot of voices that we could listen to, and there's a, this is a complicated issue. We don't have anyone here speaking about health and wellness or the importance of uh, food that's grown well um, and, and the links between those things, you know, what type of food you eat, how healthy you are, how active your brain is. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, we had a, um, some cancellations due to illness and family emergencies, um, but we haven't had a lot of women voices up here either or, you know, people of color and it's important. Just listen with your heart. That's all we can do for each other is just listen to each other with our hearts and communicate in compassion because really there's no way to put spirit into words. We're just trying to do it all the time and our community needs as much compassion as it can. There's some very dark corners that need a lot of light and a lot of love, a lot of love and a lot of compassion. though is something that really got me interested when we were working on this. We've been through a lot of the technical stuff about how plate tectonics work, you know, subduction zones and it comes back up. But th what interested me was how we've lived with these things on this planet. And there are benefits, many benefits. You know, it created, creates islands. These big plume volcanoes with their basalts have created all of those islands, wonderful things, and they're still going on creating them. Um, they don't last sometimes, they erode away when they stop erupting. It's interesting that the Hawaiian Islands themselves age, and it goes all the way up to little atolls in the Pacific that are eroding away. And they've all been built by, by these hot spots and islands that have been created. It created good gases for the atmosphere. There are people who think that most of the water on this planet was degassed over the millennia from volcanoes. It also, and, and other trace elements that enrich the soils, it's kind of interesting. 
if you get ash falls and tephra falls from volcanoes, it works pretty well as long as you don't get too much and it's not too hot. It's like everything else for everybody who gardens. You can kill all your plants with fertilizer pretty quickly if you get too carried away with it. And that is one of the problems. And of course, you've got the mountains. Scenery, water storage, they're beautiful. Um, and I asked Bill Meese what he thought of when he thought of volcanoes, and he said, subduction and skiing. And I thought, OK, well, that's, that's pretty straightforward there. The hazards are what we hear about, though. And these can be big. And one of them, disruption of air and other transportation. Planes have a real problem flying through ash clouds. Uh, so far, th they have been very lucky. Uh, most of these 747s who've lost all of their engines have managed to restart them. Uh, it's interesting that the Redoubt volcano, which went off a few years ago, put in an ash cloud so big that it practically took down a 747 near El Paso, Texas, because it ran into parts of the ash cloud. These clouds are made up of glass fragments. They're not like ash you think of from your fireplace. And jets tend to take in a great deal of air, so they take a great deal of ash. So the FAA, in the past few years, has gotten much more aware of that and tries to warn planes do not fly through a volcanic ash cloud. Um, I, uh, here we go. <laughs> I've been practicing. Uh, it, uh, 2010, practically stopped air traffic in the Northern Hemisphere for, for quite a while. It was very disruptive. And this could happen again. Uh, climate change. And it's documented throughout history, and I'll be talking about this a little more. The destruction of habitat, obviously, if you get uh, pyroclastic flows and lava flows and things like that, they're going to destroy the land. Uh, and also, of course, it injures and kills human beings who get caught. The type of volcano matters in addition to size. You've got the little cinder cones. They're messy. They rarely kill anybody. There was a poor farmer in uh, Mexico, 1943. One came up in his, his cornfield. He was out there working. He said he knew there had been a warm spot in the cornfield. But it just started going. And it created quite a sizable cinder cone. They're not long lived, they don't last very long. The shield volcanoes are the ones that construct Hawaiian Islands. Medicine Lake is a shield volcano. Uh, Newberry Volcano up in Oregon is a volcano. And they, they can explode too. Um, the Medicine Lake area is full of these wonderful um, obsidian flows which can go with explosive things. But generally, they have hotter and more liquid lavas. The strata volcanoes, such as our own Mount Shasta and the Cascades, they're gorgeous and they're hazardous. Rift zones can cause major long-term problems. Iceland sits on a rift zone where the plates are coming apart, the new magma is coming up. Iceland gets a double whammy. It's not only on a rift, it has a plume underneath it, which is why that's a lively area. They have good geothermal, but it can be a dangerous place, too. Caldera eruptions are the big ones. That's Yellowstone uh, and some of the others in history. And as I said, we've never really seen a big caldera eruption in human history. The Toba erupted about 17,000 plus or minus a few years ago. It was big. This is the caldera, which is 30 by 100 kilometers. It was a whopper. It put out, they find the tephra and ash flow from Toba practically all over Asia and um, even into the Mideast. It was big. There is a theory that this was the genetic bottleneck that wiped out a lot of the humanoids on the planet at that time. At one point we're finding there were different kinds of humans, the little hobbits at the Homo floresiensis and all the different fossils they find in Africa of humans. And the theory is that a lot of them didn't, this is like Toba today, which is in Sumatra, by the way. It's one of the Indonesian volcanoes. They're very explosive. Um, this is a genetic bottleneck. All those people on the left-hand side were there. They had a catastrophic event of some kind, which may have reduced humanity to 10,000 humans and wiped out some of the other the other sorts of humans. If any of you read about the Denisovans and, 
as I said, they didn't make it through the bottleneck. And very few of us did. And geneticists, for reasons, as I said, I'm not a geneticist, but they, have, they feel that this could have been one of the reasons that this happened and why humans are so very alike on the planet today, because we really are, despite our differences. And jumping ahead again to something, this one is one, of, one you see a lot about. Santorini Island in Greece really blew up. It was a big one in 1628 BCE. This might have been Atlantis, the origin of the Atlantis story. A civilization, the Minoans, who practically disappeared overnight. It was a whopper of an eruption. There was ash from that all over the Mediterranean. Uh, there were tsunamis set off by this, which they find traces of all over the Mideast. Uh, it possibly helped wipe out the Minoan civilization, which was one of the most advanced civilizations of the time. I keep thinking of something Carl Sagan, for those of you who know who he is, he said at one time that if the Minoans had not been wiped out, we would now be sailing through the galaxy on spaceships. <laughs> kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Um, anyway, this is a wall painting from the city that was wiped out. And it's one of the earliest pictures of a harbor. This could have, was this Atlantis? You know, there's the boats and the people going around. And there's a couple of kids, another fresco, and the elegantly dressed ladies who are sitting there chatting about something, but we don't know what, because even though they had writing, we have never deciphered their writing. It's kind of interesting. They find two forms of writing, and one of them we have deciphered turned out to be an early form of Greek. But the Minoan language, we don't even know what they call themselves. So it's kind of interesting. If you go to Crete, you can see their fabulous cities there. But what did they talk about and what did they say to each other? We don't know. Vesuvius, of course, is the one everybody thinks of when you think of a volcano. This, you've all seen the last days of Pompeii, you know, people clutching each other and gladiators. Um, probably that coast there was a real resort area for, for the Romans. They came over a lot and had a good time. Um, a very good time, according to some of the wall frescoes. I was just telling Anne that I was looking at some of them thinking, wow, I didn't know people could do that. <laughs> I was going to show some, and I thought, no, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but in 79 AD, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, uh, movies, Vesuvius there, which really had not been known to be a volcano. It was covered with vines. People were happy there. And it gave notice. It had been, had, they'd been having earthquakes there for several years, but people didn't really even realize it was a volcano. But it's, it began after a lot of earthquakes and things like that. In August of 70, 79, started with tephra flow and pyroclastic flows. And it wiped out Pompeii. This is the area where, if any of you heard, I'm trying to decide how detailed to get here. There was a gentleman named Pliny the Younger who wrote the first description of a really good volcano. He was with his mother over here in Messina, which he watched the cloud come up and everything. He, his uncle was one of the admirals of the Roman fleet who decided to take his fleet to see what he could do and go rescue people. Well, he found out he couldn't land anywhere along here because the ash was so bad and the pyroclastics. So he went down here to Stabiae, and he had a heart attack and died, which is kind of sad. But anyway, they did several TV series about things like that. <laughs> For years, they thought that the people in Herculaneum had survived. They didn't find any bodies. Sadly enough, a few years ago, they found hundreds of them huddled in boathouses along the beach who had died pretty horribly. <laughs> Hopping forward a little, we get into the Dark Ages. And this is an interesting one, because they blame practically everything in the world on the Dark Ages and this era. Something did happen during this time. There were hundreds of written stories about the sun was cold. The Chinese said we couldn't see the sky clearly enough to uh, plan. You know, We didn't know what date it was. Astronomers were getting killed because they couldn't tell the emperor 
what the exact date was, and they're saying we can't see the star Canopus because of the fog and cloud. Something major happened in those days. There was famine, severe winters in Europe, and plague, which some people say the movement of people at that time was so extreme, and with them they brought their fleas. And there was a huge depopulation of the Eastern Roman Empire. Justinian was the emperor at that time. He caught the plague, nearly died, and Theodora did, his wife. And also a time of religious upright, the rise of the Islamic states, uh, just a total, total disruption. And because we have two volcanoes, and this is one in El Salvador, they just started discovering a few years ago, was a biggie. It had ash all over the place. They find samples of ash from this place in both polar ice caps. So that suggests that was a big one. El Salvador itself was covered under ash, and it's also said that it was responsible for a lot of the migration of the Mayan people and upheavals in Central America with the big civilizations that they had there. The other suspicion one is Krakatoa. And there are a, re a lot of reports that it did something big in those days. Uh, mainly this comes from ash that they found and Chinese writings about something going on down there. Krakatoa, of course, is famous for, it's not east of Java, by the way. As the movie said, it's actually kind of southwest. But uh, Krakatoa, of course, went off in 1883 in one of the biggest eruptions that we've ever seen. And it got a lot of publicity, and it still does. This is Iceland, which, as I said, is not lucky. They are on a rift, uh, plus they have a plume. So it's very, very active in Iceland. The Icelanders, so I hear from my friend Susie Boyd, who visited, are very, very good with geothermal energy. They, and it, that's a plus, because they get it from there. On the other hand, their volcanoes are very active. Um, they had a major eruption in 1783, which killed almost all their animals, uh, one in 10 humans there. It created crop failures, dry fogs throughout Europe. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, who happened to be at France at the time, uh, asking for help with our revolution, was one of the first people who actually tied what was going on in Europe with the dry fogs and the cold summers and warm winters, which sounds like it wouldn't be bad, but it was, especially for crops. Lots of famine. Uh, but he was the first one who said, I think it's because of that Icelandic volcano. And uh, it's kind of interesting to think that it was an American there. Iceland, as I said, is a rift. And you hear about a lot of, well, Eyjafjallajökull is one of the Icelandic volcanoes. It has several that have gone off, and they can get very nasty. They put a lot of sulfur and other things into the atmosphere, which is not good. Um, the Westman Islands, which are down there, I have my handy dandy pointer. A few years ago, they had a major eruption which was threatening to close one of the only uh, ports, fishing ports they had. And they tried to stop it, and this is where they put water on it. Okay. They got all the boats they could, millions of gallons of seawater. It may have helped, no one's really sure, but you've got to give them points for trying. And actually, eventually the eruption did stop, and they came up with a better harbor than they had before. <laughs> so you got to hand it to the Icelanders, but the area there, there's Hecla, which is one of the more dangerous volcanoes that they have. And this is Ayafialadokko. Wow. Part of the thing is Iceland has a lot of ice, as you may guess, and it melts, which causes a lot of lahars, which does a lot of damage to people if you can't get out of the way. This is Tambora. Now, Tambora went off in 1815. It killed in the area, probably around 90,000 people right off. Uh, it's, it was densely populated, and nobody in 1815 in Sumatra, really, you know, they didn't have a census. You could just sort of guess. The results of this one, too, were pretty dramatic worldwide. It was a big one. It put out a lot of ash, put a lot of sulfur in the area. Um, in the United States, they call that the year without summer. And the crops failed in the US. This is just 
the immediate ash fall from Tambora. The worldwide ash fall was there, plus the sulfur it puts in the atmosphere creates a haze, which, which helps block the sun, which has interesting effects in different areas, and I'm not going to go into that too much, but it is funny that some areas got hotter summers, and some of them didn't. But in the United States, they called it the year without summer. Um, here's a comparison of the ash falls of these things, which, which I think kind of interesting. This is Pinatuba, which some of us may remember in 1991. And this is Tambora in 1815. This is the Toba that happened 17,000 years ago that may have helped wipe out all the other humanoid species except us. OK, let's get around to serious matters here. How, how can be killed in a volcanic eruption? It can be fast a pyroclastic flow, mud flow, or a traffic accident. <laughs> Seriously, fleeing, they had, uh, especially at Pinatubo years ago, lots of people that died in traffic accidents. People panic, and you can't see, and it evacuating a great number of people, especially when they're very nervous and upset, uh, can lead to things like this. You could die slowly from burns, injuries, and starvation, or you can die very slowly if civilization as we know it breaks down. Which, which could happen too, uh, especially if you can't get relief to people uh, suddenly. It's, 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 it's an interesting issue. Here are the major disasters of the past, and these were immediate death tolls from the eruption. Uh, Tambora, at least 60,000, probably 90,000. In Krakatoa, 36,000. That was mostly from the tsunamis. Krakatoa was a series of islands that really blew up. And it collapsed into itself and sent huge tsunamis to the surrounding area in Java and Sumatra, densely populated areas, low relief. And people just had no idea that this was going to be happening there. Mount Pelé and Martinique, I'll be talking about more, 30,000 people. Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, 22,000. Lockie in Iceland, I mentioned that, 10,000. And Vesuvius in Italy, 79, mainly in Pompeii. They're not too sure about that one because they haven't excavated part of that area and they don't know who's there. Penny? Yes? What does CE stand for? Christian era. I'm sorry. Oh, like AD. AD. Okay. CE is generally the, u the commonly used one now. Okay. Anyway. This is a stratovolcano, which is generally what we keep talking about. There are lots of ways that could be dangerous. Um, the main ones are the pyroclastic flows and the mud flows. The other ones, the ash fall, if you get enough of that, it collapses your roof, because eventually it's heavy. Uh, the eruption cloud, it can bring down airplanes, et cetera. And if the gases that are in here get in, especially sulfur, get into the prevailing wind in the atmosphere, they can stay up for years and help block sunlight. Plus, there's an old, an old rhyme. Mary had a little lamb. She doesn't anymore, because what was once pure H2O is H2SO4, <laughs> which is sulfuric acid. The other thing many at many of these volcanoes put out is fluorine and gases like that, chlorine, which if you get a lot of ash fall, it concentrates in the pastures and it kills the animals. That's what happened a great deal in Iceland and it's a hazard from any kind of ash fall. So this is Mount Rainier. This is a mud flow from the Emmons Glacier that happened many years ago, but you can see the impact. Mount Rainier is a problem because it's big and high, and it gets a lot of precipitation, so it's got a lot of ice on it, as our own mountain often does. And when the volcanoes get going, it melts and comes down. We, Avalanche Gulch is called Avalanche Gulch for a reason, because these things happen. And the mud flows, I think many of us are familiar with here, that have happened over the years. This is Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia. And in 1985, it was a small eruption. It wasn't even terribly big, but it was covered with ice and snow at the time. And this is one that should not have killed anybody. But it was Colombia, 
and they weren't quite sure what to do. They were working on hazard maps. There aren't a lot of scientists. At, there were not a lot of scientists at that time. They had asked for assistance from the United States, and they had several geologists packed to leave to go to Colombia to help them with this. Then they had an incident in Bogota where they had the rebels broke into one of the government offices and started killing people. So the United States did not send any geologists. So they were left with their own, their own resources and they didn't have a lot of them at that time. This set off a mud flow. And you can see this is antes before, the city of Armero. And over there is after the mud flow. And the sad part is they should have had at least an hour and a half, maybe more, warning that this was coming. People knew something was happening, but they didn't know what to do. And the mayor of the town, as so often happens, is saying, nothing's going to happen, don't worry about it. So everybody goes to bed that night in Armero, and a lot of them died. There's another picture of what it looked like after the mud flow went through. This is a hazard map that they prepared later that shows the volcano there. And this is where the rivers. And that's Armero, one of the cities that got uh, wiped out. And this is Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is famous for mud flows. They've had 60 major ones in the last 10,000 years. They had a huge one of what, five, 6,000 years ago that went all the way to Puget Sound. There are a lot of cities there that are built on these mud flows. And some of them do have plans in store. They have, uh, I've seen some where they have plans to, the sirens go off, you go up the hill, because that's what you want to do if you're having a mud flow. Don't try to go up, do not go down river, because that's probably not going to be a good idea. Go up, and in many cases, just a, you know, 20 feet might save your life. But this is, Mount, Mount Rainier is notorious for these, and these can happen kind of unexpectedly. You don't really need an eruption sometimes to have these happen. This is a pyroclastic flow from St. Helens, and I think all of us watched the videos of, of that going, the bulge and everything like that. St. Helens was interesting because it started, erupt, started making noises in March of 1980. They had a lot, started having a lot of earthquakes, and it, it got the attention of a lot of scientists, including the US Geological Survey, who are the creme de la creme of the geologic world, and they started monitoring it. No one had ever really seen a Cascade volcano go off, and despite monitoring the earthquakes and the gases and things like that, it was like, what's gonna happen? We're not sure. Plus, they ran into a lot of political problems. <laughs> and I don't know if anybody has followed that. There were people who claimed, of course, it was all a plot by the USGS to get more funding. There were people who said that they had been planning a big development at Spirit Lake, where good old Harry Truman lived, and that this was a plot to keep that from happening. The volcano kept shaking, and more and more people kept coming to monitor it. Plus, they had huge numbers of tourists busloads of them. It was really popular. It was becoming the local industry. And as the volcano kept shaking, and finally, on March 27th, it produced, it blew. Not heavily, but it, enough to get, look scenic and entertaining. People wanted to get near the volcano, and the geologists were trying to outline an area where you shouldn't go. But people weren't believing them. It was like, wait a minute, I own land up there. It's my property, blah, blah, blah. And you had old Harry Truman. If any of you remember him, this was the old guy in his 80s who had a lodge at Spirit Lake. And he was not going to leave. He became kind of a folk hero. And it's kind of sad. I often wonder if he would have left if he hadn't become so publicly a hero. It's like he couldn't back down at that point. But uh, he said he knew a secret mine shaft he was going to stay in and that the volcano wouldn't hurt him anyway. After all the hassle, it kept going on and on and on, and Weyerhaeuser wanted to get in there, log, and people wanted to get in there, and the scientists are saying, we just don't think this is a good idea. And they're like, well, when's it going to blow? Oh, we're not sure. Here are two scientists, one of whom I, I actually knew. Um, 
the observation post that they set up at Coldwater Ridge was about five, six miles from the volcano. They knew it was dangerous. In fact, the geologist who was in charge of that didn't feel comfortable having people sitting there observing the volcano. He asked for television equipment to be put there. It would have cost $40,000. Uh, he was denied. So he had to put an observer there. And the usual observer was a gentleman on the right named Harry Glickett, who was working on his PhD. But he had to go to UCSB, which happens to be where I went to school, to uh, talk with his advisors. So for one night, David Johnston, who's the gentleman on the left, took his place on Coldwater Ridge. And that happened to have been the night of May 18th, 1980. So that night, David Johnston was killed. The mountain blew royally. It set off a lateral blast out to the side, which no one had really expected. And there were at least 57 other people who died that day. There might have been more. Nobody really knew how many people were in the area because people were just gleefully going off on logging roads and going to take pictures, and, and they, didn't believe, they didn't believe the scientists anyway. Anyway, Mount St. Helens blew, and there it is afterwards. Harry Glicken went, was des just desolate at the loss of his friend David Johnston, and he felt guilty because he said it should have been me. He went on to study geology for years, and he specialized in volcanoes and pyroclastic flows. He eventually got together with a couple named Katya and Maurice Kraft. If you have seen volcano films, especially up close, it's quite likely they took them. This was a couple who were very dedicated, took all kinds of risks. They made many wonderful films. They died at Mount Unzen, Japan, with Harry Glicken and 40 other people in a pyroclastic flow. They guessed wrong. They didn't think they had an observation point they thought was going to be safe. It wasn't. They died there. Why this hits me now is the, one of the films they did on pyroclastic flows was used by geologists at Mount Pinatubo in 1991. USGS people went over to help the Philippines in 1991 when it looked like this volcano was going off. And they were stationed at Clark Air Force Base. And they were having a terrible time convincing the Air Force and the Philippine government that something was going to happen at Mount Pinatubo. They had done, they started doing research around the base and they were saying, wait a minute, you know, this is a dangerous place. There's tons of tephra. It looks like we've had pyroclastic flows here. And they were like, where from? They weren't even sure Pinatubo was, you know, still active. It was, and it really started kicking up. To convince the people at Clark Air Force Base, especially the hard-headed military, excuse me, darling, <laughs> that something could happen, they showed the craft films and they showed them to everybody. They showed them to the mayors of the people around. And as this volcano just kept shaking and getting wilder and wilder, they finally got people to evacuate. Clark Air Force Base was evacuated, and the surrounding areas were evacuated. They got the airplanes, planes and stuff like that, out of Clark Air Force Base. They really had a fight with the Philippines, too, because at that time, the US was negotiating for Subic Bay and Clark Air Force Base. And there were a lot of people in the Philippines who were opposed to this. They would just wanted you know, us out. And when the geologists kept saying something's going to happen, of course, the rumor was they're just doing this because they want better terms to negotiate. But eventually, thank heavens, they got some people. And when Mount Pinatubo blew, and it was big, and very few people were killed, most of them from staying in their houses, which collapsed due to the weight of the tephra. So it's an interesting story how all of these things hook together. They were also lucky enough that many of the geologists who had been at Mount St. Helens were at Mount Pinatubo. And they had seen this. They knew what could happen. Also, the lead geologist there had been in the Peace Corps in the Philippines in 1970. He spoke the language and was married to a Filipina. So he was able to relate to things. So they were, it was just the circumstances that came together there that, that really helped the situation. Pinatubo was also one of the first monitored 
by satellite and other things to really tell about the worldwide atmosphere. It did lower temperatures on the planet, not by a lot, but by enough to be noticed, and caused haze in many areas. That's a famous photograph wow. running away. That looks like something from that looks like something from Dante's Peak, <laughs> which was a pretty good movie, actually. They made it. Okay. This is the sample again. We have never seen in human history anything like this. Those are the biggies. We haven't seen them. We know they've happened because we have traces of them. We know they were big, and they, we know they're dangerous. For example, Long Valley Caldera, which is Mammoth Mountain and that whole beautiful area over there, really blue, 730,000 before the Christian era. This is the major ash fall from that, which would create quite a problem for everybody concerned. This is Mount St. Helens ash in 1980, and I think a lot of us remember seeing film strips from this and whatever, and I think we even had some here. The Long Valley Caldera, their ash was there. Okay. Yellowstone, the ash falls from the three different eruptions we have tracked there, this is it. And that's just the, the big ash ball. As I said, we have never seen really what one of these would do. We, we can speculate, we can do computer modeling of them, uh, which we've done, but we've never really seen one happen in human history. And Yellowstone continues to shake and go up and down. It could do this for millennia. We just, we simply don't know. And this is interesting because Indonesian volcanoes, there's Toba up at the top, which was the biggie that went off about 70,000 years ago. There's Krakatoa, which killed 36,000 people in the beaches there. There's Tambora, which was big in 1815. And this is Mount Agung, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this properly. It is in Bali, and it's been in the news lately quite a bit. And the interesting part about that at the moment is it could kill a lot of people, and it has before. And they've been evacuating, but it's just kind of still just kind of steaming and shaking. And from what I've been hearing lately, people are starting to go back now. They've had several of the local priests who've been climbing the mountain and throwing offerings in to shut it down. Uh, who knows? I have no idea. I'm not going to speculate on whether that might work or not. So far, it has not really blown. There's, that's where it is on Bali. Um, it's caused a lot of disruption and a lot of loss in tourists, which of course is always an impact when a volcano starts to act up. What's this going to do to us economically? Uh, years ago, on the, uh, was it Mount Soufriere, they evacuated so many people and the mountain really didn't blow. It just kind of fiddled around, but it destroyed the economy of a lot of these areas. And there's Mount Nagoon as it went off. I was following that one, thinking something might happen. Okay, my, the, the, the volcano story that got to me when I was researching this is in Martinique, which is over here. There's the Caribbean there. Martinique is, is a small island, and actually it's quite famous as being the birthplace of three interesting women, one of whom was the Empress Josephine, who married Napoleon, one of whom was a woman named Francois de Bigny, who became the quiet wife of Louis XIV. And the other one was a woman named Amie de Rivery, who was captured by pilots and went, pirates and went on to become the Sultana of Turkey, which is kind of an interesting from a little island in the Caribbean. Okay. Martinique was considered a really desirable place to live in the French. Saint Pierre was their biggest city right here. Uh, the capital was at Fort de France, which had about 20,000 people. St. Pierre had about 30,000 people. But in the surrounding area, they had a lot of little plantations and things like that. And it was considered generally a pretty desirable place to live. Starting in 19, this is a picture of, this is St. Pierre in the 1880s. Behind it is their volcano, Mount Pelé. And it had erupted in the past, but it hadn't done anything particularly particularly interesting. It was scenic, they thought, and people used to climb it all the time and have parties up there. There were lakes and whatever. It's really not very tall. 
There's also an interesting story about an Italian captain who pulled into the port at St. Pierre to unload rum, or load rum, because rum was their big export. And halfway through, he looked up at Mount Pelé and said, if Vesuvius looked like your volcano, I'd get out of Naples. <laughs> and he was going to leave. Some of the local um, customs officials went out to his boat and said, we are not leaving. You know, you're going to finish loading. And the captain said, you're going to swim because you're not staying on my ship because I'm leaving. And he did. Well, he was smart because the next morning, and it was Ascension Day, um, Mount Pelé shot off a pyroclastic flow and it killed everyone in the city in about four or five minutes, oh, including the governor and his wife and four members of the scientific commission who'd gone over there to look. Um, this is the city after the pyroclastic flow went through. And it was pretty shocking to almost the world because they'd never seen anything like this before. There were many scientific, uh, actually, they learned a lot from, from, uh, from this tragedy. Uh, scientists from all over the world went to Martinique. The, I, the mountain shot off a few more uh, pyroclastic flows. They were able to observe them. Um, but it did have a terrible death toll. This man was one of the two survivors. He was in an underground, there's, a, there's his prison today, it was an underground solitary confinement. He was an illiterate gentleman, they're not sure what his name was. Uh, they used to call him Samson because he was a big strong guy. But they think his name was Augustus Paras. They didn't know what he did because all of the uh, records were gone. He survived St. Pierre and went on to join the Barnum and Bailey Circus. This is a true story, as, as an exhibit, pretty much. Um, the interesting part is after, after it blew, there were a lot of refugees in the northern part of Martinique, and they all streamed down into Fort de France. And Fort de France was 20,000 people, and suddenly they were, there were thousands of these refugees coming, including 2,000 from a place called Morne Rouge which was just on the edge of, of St. Pierre and had not really been that much affected. Well, it became such a burden to the people who were down there. They were giving them supplies and housing, but the people who were there were complaining because they're getting more than we are. So finally, the governor, the, the new governor, because the old one had died, the lieutenant governor, orders 2,000 people to go back to Morn Rouge, which is a place just outside of St. Pierre. Go back or we're gonna cut off any assistance to you. So these people, 2,000 of them, went back to Morn Rouge. A few weeks later, there was another pyroclastic flow which killed, killed them. And one of the people there was Father Mary. And he had been one of the ones who helped save Ludger or Augusta or whatever his name happened to be. Father Mary was the parish priest there. He was, he was very loved and, and very popular. There's a picture of him. I really don't know much more about him. I wish I did. He was horribly burned in that pyroclastic flow and he was taken back to Fort de France and they took him to a nunnery hospital there where he was being carefully cared for. No one wanted to tell him that those 2,000 people had died. And finally, one of the sisters, he demanded to know, and she said, I'm sorry, Father, they all died. The story is that Father Mary turned his head to the wall and said, I must tend my flock, and he died. Oh. I was, that story gets me. It's, it's one of those stories you hear, you don't know if it's true. Yes. Uh, from what they know of the man, it well may have been true. But it shows the kind, of, the kind of humans that get involved in these things, and the brave, kind ones who stay to help, and the cowardly ones like the governor. Now, here we go. Getting back to local stuff. This is a painting done of what it possibly would look like if Shastina decided to blow. And here is the current USGS hazard area for what might happen to us. 
And as you can see, in the purple, it could be lava flows, pyroclastic flows, thick tephra, um, lahars and mud flows, and the areas around it would get regional lava flows and things like that. There are some other ones. Uh, this is from mud flows, and as you can see, they tend to follow low areas, Cascade Gulch and other things like that, Diller Canyon, which is pretty distinctive to this day. Here are possible lava flows. The Mount Shasta lava flows are very thick and very high. I mean, you can see that wonderful one when you're driving down 97, you drive right past the edge of it. They tend not to go terribly far, and you can outrun them very easily. This is a pyroclastic flows for the last 10,000 years. Uh, as Dr. Hurt once said, the only way to survive one of these is to not to be somewhere else. <laughs> and fortunate, and as you know, they, they also go downhill. So all things considered, don't run to Dunsmuir if you think that's going to happen. Go the other way. <laughs> this is in the last 10,000 years. Mount Shasta, as we know, has been pretty quiet for the, the last 10,000 years or so. There may have been minor eruptions. Um, there probably was not an eruption with La Perouse, as we all talk about the, the French sailor who said he thought he saw Mount Shasta from the ocean, which Bill Meese has pretty thoroughly refuted in his material. And here's another, another hazard map of what could happen. It depends on the way the wind's blowing. This should be familiar to you. Here's Mount Shasta, of course, and you can see Black Butte over there to the right, and the Shasta Valley. For years, geologists did not figure out what, what was going on there. They had all of these little hillocks, which were made of volcanic material, but they were all turned around in different directions, and nobody knew quite what to make of them. How did this happen? This is Mount St. Helens. And suddenly people are saying, wait a minute, there was this big landslide followed by a lateral blast. And here we go. So we feel pretty sure that about 350 to 400,000 years ago, the sand flat cone, which was Mount Shasta at that time, lost a huge portion of its mass. It came down through the Shasta Valley, almost up to Wairika. We drive through it all the time. And that's where all those little hillocks came from. It's probably one of the biggest landslides we've ever found. The interesting part about that one, at least to today, to, to, to today is they don't think it caused an eruption. In other words, the magma chamber was not exposed, as it was on Mount St. Helens when they had that big landslide there. The magma chamber was exposed, and it came out. They don't think that happened. This one, they can't decide it was an earthquake or just, just mass wasting because that does happen. The future of Mount Shasta. This is Mount Zama, or Crater Lake as we know it today. It could blow up and become a caldera. It's possible. The other possibility, which they've just found, is it could end up like Rainbow Mountain, which was a big stratovolcano about a million years ago, part of the Cascades, which has just simply eroded away. It stopped erupting. It stopped providing new things. And over the years, the glaciation and just plain old erosion has, has taken it down to this. You can see it from uh, the road over by Deer Mountain. You can still see it's kind of low hills and kind of a peaceful end for a volcano. People worry, obviously, when they come here, and that's one of the questions we get here at the museum a lot, is when is Mount Shasta going to explode again? Well, we don't know. You know, it's not likely at least not immediately, but it's very well monitored. This is the current monitoring stations, and if you are so interested, you can go online to the USGS Cascades Observatory for California. You can pull up this, and you can click on the seismometers or the GPS stations, which show if the mountain's expanding or not or getting ready to blow. Follow the golden road. 
Follow the golden road. Follow, 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 follow the golden road. We're off to see the golden, the golden road TV show. You'll find it is a whiz of a show, if ever a show there was. It's arts and culture and history, environment, health, technology, and peace and justice, science, just because, because of the meaningful things it does. We're off to see the golden, the golden road TV show.